Hello, today we're going to go over Act 1, Scene 1 of Romeo and Juliet. As you can see, our story takes place in Verona in a public place. Enter Samson and Gregory of the House of Capulet, armed with swords and bucklers. I'm going to go ahead and get our recording started, and I'll pause it periodically. Of Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act 1. Scene 1. A public place. Enter Samson and Gregory, armed with swords and bucklers. Gregory, on my word, will not carry coals. No, for then we should be coalers. I mean, and we be in collar, we'll draw. Aye, while you live, draw your neck out of the collar. I strike quickly, being moved. But thou art not quickly moved to strike. A dog of the house of Montague moves me. To move is to stir, and to be valiant is to stand. Therefore, if thou art moved, thou runst away. A dog of that house shall move me to stand. I will take the wall of any man or maid of Montague's. That shows thee a weak slave, for the weakest goes to the wall. True, and therefore women, being the weaker vessels, are ever thrust to the wall. Therefore I will push Montague's men from the wall, and thrust his maids to the wall. The quarrel is between our masters, and us their men. Tis all one. I will show myself a tyrant. When I have fought with the men, I will be cruel with the maids. I will cut off their heads. The heads of the maids? Aye, the heads of the maids, or their maiden heads. Take it in what sense thou wilt. They must take it in sense that feel it. Me they shall feel while I am able to stand. And tis known I am a pretty piece of flesh. Tis well thou art not fish. If thou hadst, thou hadst been poor John. Draw thy tool. Here comes two of the house of Montagues. My naked weapon is out. Quarrel, I will back thee. All right, let's pause right there. All right, obviously Gregory and Samson are of the Capulet household, and they hate the Montagues naturally. Uh, they are kind of having a back and forth, and they're talking about how big and bad they would be if they encountered uh, any of the Montagues. I always relate this to my students as, you know, young men who kind of walk around puffed up, ready to fight. We've all met that person. That's what they're doing right now. They are talking this big talk because the Montagues aren't around and it's easy to act big and tough. I'm always curious what they would be like in a real fight, which we'll see in a little bit. Uh, also, here we have uh, already Shakespeare's famous double entendre. Um, when they're talking about they're going to behead the maids and then the maiden heads, uh, beheading the maids is one thing, taking away maiden heads, uh, maiden head means virginity. So I won't go much more into that, but basically Samson and Gregory are making sexual innuendos here. And you'll see that Romeo and Juliet is full of them. I'm not going to point them all out, but that's already just in the first two minutes of the play, you see there's like this, um, you know, these sexual innuendos. Now we see that the Montagues are coming into the scene, and Samson is saying, my naked weapon is out, quarrel, I'll back thee. All right, let's restart. How? Turn thy back and run? Fear me not. No, Mary, I fear thee. Let us take the law of our sides. Let them begin. I will frown as I pass by, and let them take it as they list. Nay, as they dare, I will bite my thumb at them, which is disgrace to them if they bear it. Enter Abraham and Balthazar. Do you bite your thumb at us, sir? I do bite my thumb, sir. Do you bite your thumb at us, sir? Is the law of our side if I say I? No. No, sir, I do not bite my thumb at you, sir, but I bite my thumb, sir. Do you quarrel, sir? Quarrel, sir? No, sir. But if you do, sir, am for you. I serve as good a man as you. No better. Well, sir. Say better. Here comes one of my master's kinsmen. Yes, better, sir. You lie. Draw, if you be men. Gregory, remember thy swashing blow. They fight. Enter Benvolio. 
All right, before we meet Benvolio, let's talk about what just happened here. So, um, a couple important things to note. We have an aside to Gregory, if you haven't already learned this yet. An aside is oftentimes when either a character turns to another character on the stage and is saying something um, that they don't want the other characters to hear, or sometimes an aside is also said to the audience directly. It kind of gives us insight into what that character is thinking. Now, you may be wondering, what is all this biting your thumb at each other? Well, back in the day, biting your thumb was basically kind of like giving the middle finger to somebody. It was an extreme insult. And um, now you know. So if you bite your thumb at somebody and they bite back, we know what's going on. It's kind of interesting because Gregory says, oh, I'll frown when they go by. And so that if they react, it's on them because they know that they're not supposed to be starting fights. So they're just thinking, well, we'll provoke them. Well, think about you're seeing your rival school walking by and they just have their you know middle finger in the air at you they're not pointing at you per se but they're just waving it around do you think you might take offense to it likely and that's exactly what gregory and samson are trying to do you'll see that samson says nay as they dare i will bite my thumb at them which is a disgrace if they bear it so they know that if the montagues let it slide then they're kind of being cowardly interesting Two is their use of the word sir. Do you bite your thumb at us, sir? I do bite my thumb, sir. Notice all these sirs. It's not because they're trying to be polite and respectful. It's kind of like um, when you make fun of uh, maybe a frilly girl and you say, oh, is this all you'd like, your highness? Is there anything else I can bring you, your highness? It's not really a term of endearment. It's meant to signify that this person is frivolous and silly and vain okay so the sir here is meant to be an insult and that's why they keep saying it back and forth now um they begin to fight naturally um and here comes benvolio let's hear what he has to say part fools put up your swords you know not what you do beats down their swords enter tybalt what art thou drawn among these heartless hinds Turn thee, Benvolio. Look upon my dead. I do but keep the peace. Put up thy sword, or manage it to part these men with me. What? Drawn and talk of peace. I hate the word, as I hate hell, all Montagues, and thee. Have at thee, coward. They fight. Enter several of both houses, who join the fray. Then enter citizens with clubs. Clubs, bills and partisans, strike, beat them down. Down with the Capulet, down with the Montagues. Enter Capulet in his gown, and Lady Capulet. What noise is this? Give me my long sword, oh. The crutch, the crutch, why call you his sword? My sword, I say. Old Montague is come, and flourishes his blade in spite of me. Enter Montague and his Lady Montague. Thou villain, Capulet, hold me not, let me go. Thou shalt not stir one foot to seek a foe. Enter Prince with attendants. Let's pause before we get into Prince Aeschylus's uh, monologue here. What we have is Tybalt, who is actually Juliet's cousin. He is a Capulet. And we have Benvolio, which is Romeo's cousin, who is a Montague. And as you can see, Benvolio wants peace. He doesn't want to start, start a fight. And what does Tybalt think of that? He hates the word as he hates hell and all Montagues, and he says, have at the coward. So already we can see personality differences between Benvolio and Tybalt. Uh, Benvolio, somebody who's a little bit more sensible, realizes that there's danger, and this is kind of stupid to be fighting like this. Tybalt, who loves the fight. And again, we all know that person who loves the drama of the fight, and Tybalt is definitely one of those. He has immense pride and will not take insult. Here where it says first citizen, this kind of just is to amp up the fight again. And here we have uh, Capulet in his gown enter with Lady Capulet. Now, whenever you see Capulet, you know this is like the head guy of his family. And hence, they only use the name Capulet. This is uh, Juliet's dad. And then Lady Capulet would be Juliet's mom, his wife. Um, now, I think it's hilarious because the men in here are saying, give me my sword, I'm going to go fight. And Lady Capulet says, a sword? 
a crutch, a crutch, meaning you're old and rickety. What are you doing thinking you're going to go out there and fight? I can almost hear my mom saying it to my dad right now. Here we have um, Montague and Lady Montague. And so this would be Romeo's dad and Romeo's mom. And Romeo's dad also wants to enter the fight. He says, thou villain Capulet, hold me not, let me go. And Lady Montague says, thou shalt not stir a foot to seek a foe, meaning you best not step out there and get in a fight. So um, here we have Prince come in with his attendants, and let's hear what he has to say. Rebellious subjects, enemies to peace, profaners of this neighbor's stainless steel. You will not hear. What hold you men of beasts that quench the fire of your pernicious rain with purple fountains issuing from your veins and pain of torture from your blood of you. Throw your mistempered weapons to the ground and hear the sentence of your moving pelt. Green civil glories, bread of an airy world, I did, old Capulet and Montague, cut thrice the spoil of my bloodshed and made the Rome's ancient citizens cast by their grave and seeming ornament to the real their partisans with hands as hard as canker pickers to part your cankered feet. If you ever disturb our streets again, your lives shall pay for forfeit of the peace. For this time, all the rest of my beloved, you, Captain, shall go along with me. And Montague, come you this afternoon to know our harder pleasure in this fight. Your free time, our common judgment day. Once more, on pain of death, your man Excellent, Exeunt, Prince and Attendants, Capulet, Lady Capulet, Tybalt, Citizens and Servants. Who set this ancient quarrel new abroach? Speak, nephew, will you buy when it began? Here were the servants of your adversary and yours, close fighting ere I did approach. I drew to part them. In the instant came the fiery Tybalt, with his sword prepared, which, as he breathed defiance to my ears, he swung about his head and cut the winds who, nothing hurt withal, hissed him in scorn. While we were interchanging thrusts and blows, came more and more and fought on part and part, till the prince came who parted either part. Oh, where is Romeo? Saw you him today? Right glad I am he was not at this fray. Let's pause very quick, because Prince Aeschylus says something really important here. He obviously stops the fight. He's the guy in charge. He's their royalty. And how many times have Montagues and Capulets started a fight in Verona? He says it. Did you see it? Three civil bras, bred of an airy word, just by some stupid uh, flighty comment. And he says, if ever you disturb the peace of these streets again, your life shall pay the forfeit of the peace. Basically meaning, if anybody starts a fight again, they're going to be put to death. So, this is an interesting proclamation made right away in the exposition because it seems like with the nature of the Montagues and the Capulets, there's likely going to be fighting again. So does that mean that people are going to be put to death for their fighting? We'll have to wait and see. With that said, here we have uh, Montague and Benvolio and Lady Montague speaking, and they're talking about Romeo. We have not encountered Romeo yet in the play, and Lady Montague is asking where Romeo is. Let's hear what Benvolio has to say about Romeo. Madam, an hour before the worshipped sun peered forth the golden window of the east, a troubled mind drave me to walk abroad, where, underneath the grove of sycamore that westward rooteth from the city's side, so early walking did I see your son. Towards him I made, but he was ware of me and stole into the covert of the wood. I, measuring his affections by my own that are most busied when they're most alone, Pursued my humour, not pursuing his, and gladly shunned who gladly fled from me. Many a morning had he there been seen, with tears augmenting the fresh morning's dew, 
adding to clouds more clouds with his deep sighs. And all so soon as the all-cheering sun should in the farthest east begin to draw the shady curtains from Aurora's bed, away from light steals home my heavy son, and the private in his chamber pens himself, shuts up his windows, locks fair daylight out, and makes himself an artificial night. Black and portentous must this humour prove, unless good counsel may the cause remove. My noble uncle, do you know the cause? I neither know it, nor can learn of him. Have you importuned him by any means? Both by myself and many other friends. But he, his own affection's counsellor, is to himself, I will not say how true, but to himself so secret and so close and so far from sounding and discovery, as is the bud bit with an envious worm, ere he can spread his sweet leaves to the air, or dedicate his beauty to the sun. Could we but learn from whence his sorrows grow, we would as willingly give cure as know. See where he comes! So please you, step aside. I'll know his grievance, or be much denied. I would thou wert so happy by thy stay to hear true shrift. Come, madam, let's away. Let's pause right quick before we start talking to Romeo. Uh, Benvolio's talking to Lady Montague and Montague about Romeo, and we learn some stuff about poor Romeo. Romeo has been feeling depressed. Every morning, Benvolio sees him walking throughout the street, and he's crying so much that he is augmenting the dew with his own tears, meaning he's uh, just adding so much water through his tears. We also see that he locks himself away at during the day and makes himself an artificial night, meaning that he pulls all the uh, curtains closed and makes it so that it's dark and grim inside of his room. This all leads us to believe that Romeo is depressed. Now, Matayu cannot figure out for the life of him why Romeo would be so depressed, and Benvolio has agreed to figure it out for them. Interestingly, I think parents do this all the time. Uh, you might ask, they might ask an older sibling, hey, go figure out what's, what's bugging your sister and why she's acting moody lately. Or they might ask, go ask your younger brother why he has been, uh, you know, acting rude and see what's wrong. And that's exactly what Benvolio is going to do. So, Montague and Lady Montague exit the scene, and here we have Benvolio meeting Romeo, and we get to meet Romeo in person for the first time. Here we go. Exit Montague and Lady. Enter Romeo. Good morrow, cousin. Is the day so young? But you struck nine. Ay, sad hours soon rain. That my father that once my sick was? It was. What sadness lengthens Romeo's hours? Not having that which having makes me true. In love? Happiness. Of love? Out of her favour where I am in love. Alas, that love so gentle in his view should be so tyrannous and rough in proof. Alas, that love, whose view is mickle still, should without eyes see pathways to his will. Where should he die? Who the fray was here? Yet tell me not, for I have heard little of Here's much to do with hate, but more with love. Why then, O oh, brawling love, O oh, loving hate, O oh, anything of nothing first create? O oh, heavy lightness, serious vanity, misshapen chaos of well-seeming forms, Feathers of lead, bright smoke, cold fire, sick health, still waking sleep. That is not what it is. This love feel I, but feel no love in this. Dost thou not laugh? No, cause I rather weep. Good heart at what? At thy good heart's oppression. Why, such is love's transgression. Griefs of mine own lie heavy in my breast which thou wilt proper go to have it pressed with more of thine. This love that thou hast shown doth add more grief to too much of mine own. Love is a smoke raised with a fume of sighs, being purged a fire sparkling in lovers' eyes, being vexed a sea nourished with a lover's tears. 
what is it else? A madness most discreet, a choking gall and a preserving sweet. Farewell, my cubs. Going, soft, I will go along. And if you leave me so, you do me wrong. I have lost myself, I am not here. This is not Rome yet, it is some other world. Tell me, in sadness, who is that you love? Yes, shall I groan and tell thee? Groan? Why, no, but sadly tell me who. Let's pause right quick. So, we have Romeo and Benvolio talking, and we realize shortly into their conversation what is making Romeo's hour so long and sad. He's in love. Actually, out of love, if you're talking to Romeo. And he's out of her favor where he's in love, meaning that he loves this girl, but she doesn't love him back. And Romeo is so tortured by this. You'll see his long spiel here. He gives a bunch of oxymorons. So if your teacher is asking you to find oxymorons, here we have a bunch. Oxymorons are two words next to each other that are opposite in nature. So an example that you hear a lot is the words jumbo shrimp. Typically, we don't think jumbo and shrimp as being similar, but together they make sense. Here we have the words brawling love, loving hate, heavy lightness, serious vanity, bright smoke, cold fire, sick health. All these opposite uh, you know, terms are put together for a dramatic effect. Another thing is that uh, we don't know who he is in love with. And Benvolio is trying to get it out of him. So we're about to figure that out. Let's read on and figure out who is it that he's pining for. We, it's natural to assume that it's Juliet because the title is Romeo and Juliet. Let's see if our inclinations are correct. Did a sick man in sadness make his will? Ah, word ill urged to one that is so ill. In sadness, cousin, I did love a woman. I aimed so near when I supposed you loved. A right good markman, and she's fair, I will. A right fair mark, fair cuz, is soonest hit. Well, in that hit you miss, she'll not be hit with Cupid's arrow. She hath Diana's wit, and in strong proof of chastity well armed. From love's weak child of her bow she lit on her arm. She will not stay the siege of love in turn, nor fly from tempt of assailing arms nor ape her rank to saint Sir Jason Bird. Oh, she's rich in beauty, only cold that when she dies, her beauty dies her soul. Then she hath sworn that she will still live chaste? She hath, and in that sparing makes huge waste for beauty, starved with her severity, cuts beauty off from all posterity. She's too fair, too wise, wisely too fair. To merit bliss by making me despair. She hath forsworn to love, and in that vow do I live dead, but live to tell it now. Be ruled by me. Forget to think of her. Oh, teach me how I shall be better to think. By giving liberty unto thine eyes, examine other beauties. Tis the way to call hers exquisite and question more. These happy masks that kiss fair ladies' brow, being black, forces in mind they hide the flower. He that is struck and blind cannot forget the precious treasure of his eyesight lost. Show me a mistress that is passing fair. What doth her beauty serve but as a note where I may read the heart of that passing fair? Farewell. Thou canst not teach me. I'll pay that doctrine, or else die in debt. Excellent. All right, so that's the end of Act 1, Scene 1. Let's kind of recap. We still don't really know who Romeo is in love with, but we know that this woman has sworn to live chase. And Benvolio deduces that because he's uh, but Romeo in the line before says, oh, she is rich in beauty, only poor that when she dies, her beauty dies in her store. And um, Benvolio figures out she's going to live chaste. Living chaste during this time period means that she would become a nun. Unfortunately, 
the options for women during the time period in which Romeo and Benvolio lived was very limited. And basically, they could either get married or become a nun. And really, if you look at the potential freedoms that a woman could have during that time period, becoming a nun might have offered more. Not necessarily always, but think about if you were married off, you basically went from being the property of your father to being the property of your husband. The expectation is that you would have children for your husband and be dutiful and do whatever your husband says. Now, um, I don't know about you, but as a modern woman, that would be kind of a tough lifestyle. And I might have been tempted back then to live as a nun so, so that you could have a little bit more autonomy. Uh, with that said, we know that nuns live chaste lifestyles and they never marry. And they basically dedicate them li their lives to the church. And Romeo thinks, what a waste of all this beauty for someone to become a nun and he doesn't even get to, you know, partake in her beauty at all. Poor Romeo. Uh, but Volio offers some advice. And I always ask my students if he, they think it's good advice. He says, be ruled by me, forget to think of her. And Romeo says, oh, teach me how I should forget to think. How could I love anybody else but this most beautiful woman that has ever lived on the whole earth, basically. And Benvolio says, by giving liberty onto thine eyes, examine other beauties. The translation here is that Benvolio says, hey, look at other cute girls. You're going to fall for somebody else. And Robio says, you cannot teach me to forget her. There is no way. Um, and Benvolio says, I'll pay that doctrine or else die in debt, meaning I'm going to try to help you. Personally, I think this is a great advice for a young teenage person. If they're, you know, upset about a breakup or they are pining for somebody they can't have, unrequited love, go out, make new friends. You might find somebody else that you like. Benvolio, I think, is really being sensible here. So, let's do a quick recap of the Act 1 uh, aspects that you should know before moving on to Act 1, Scene 2. And we'll just wait a second. Oh, here it is. Okay, so we know we start the scene out with the Capulets boasting about fi fighting the Montagues. And the Capulets start a fight by fighting their thumbs at the Montagues, which you see in the depiction here. Again, this is a really quick summary. We know that uh, Benvolio shows up and wants to stop the fighting. And Tybalt, who is Juliet's cousin, shows up and wants to continue the fighting. Remember, he hates hell. Um and Montagues. And Prince Aeschylus shows up and stops the fight. We know that the Capulets and the Montagues have started brawls three times throughout the city and that the next people who start a fight will be sentenced to death. We also know at the end of Act 1, Scene 1, that Romeo's parents are wondering why Romeo has been so depressed. And they ask Benvolio to try to figure out the sources of his sadness. Benvolio shows up and figures out that Romeo is depressed about a girl. The girl he loves has sworn to become a nun, and shucks, Romeo wanted to marry this girl. So what is he going to do to convince her? All right, this is where we leave off for Act 1, Scene 1. I hope you enjoyed this video and that it was helpful. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to comment on the video below. Or go to my website, Devoted Scholar, and you can email me there. Or you can find this um, completed uh, Google slide there for you to access for free. And other assignments for free as well are accessible there. If you're not one of my students, feel free to utilize those resources. Um, and again, I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for watching, and check in for Act 1, Scene 2 coming up next.